Whoa, all right. So, yeah. New Orleans Pelicans, Phoenix Let, Suns. Let's get into the Pelican Suns. Hey, you want to talk about these unders? <laughs> Do you want to talk about these unders or not? Not the clout. Folks, the New Orleans Pelicans have looked at Chris Paul, and despite he had a brilliant game three, where he did the Chris Paul playoff thing. Hey, I'm going to data collect for these 36 minutes, and then the fourth quarter, I'm just going to end you. And let me just tell you, that is one of the more annoying experiences you can have in playoff time. Because he's going to get to a spot, and there's not really much you can do about it. And he's hitting those shots. And now the, the game's over. And it's literally just five minutes of basketball where Chris Paul decided, yep, you're done. But game four. Game four is different. As well as games one and games two. Uh Uh-huh. The New Orleans Pelicans looked at Chris Paul and said, hey, we're going to go under. And I'm intrigued every time they do it. Now, they got to be careful because there are some built-in counters. If they're going to keep going this far under, Phoenix is just going to start rescreening, and he's going to get elbow pull-ups. But how do you feel about it, sir? (laughs) Oh, I guess to answer your question first, like I am a little bit intrigued by it. I'm intrigued by the under, and I think it works because they have Herb Jones on, especially now with Devin Booker out. So now you are <clears throat> taking away the drive, which Chris Paul isn't getting to the rim a ton these days anyway, but you're cutting that off. And you also have the length to contest the jumper in theory because Herb is incredible. So it works there. I am more intrigued by what's happening before the initial screen when it comes to Chris Paul defense because – I mean, it's been <clears throat> it's been happening all series, but like game four in particular, they are picking that man up full court. They are trying to make Phoenix bleed the clock. Herb Jones has done it. Jose Alvarado has done it. Jose Alvarado got a whole eight second violation doing it. Yes. Jose ate that man's lunch in the fourth quarter. It was a wild thing to see. I really enjoy them being like, you know what? I, I I just picture the coaches being where it's like, should we put Jose on him? Nah, nah, nah. They'll go to the post. Pick and roll might not be the same. And they're like, you know what? Just go bother him. <laughs> and this man, this man's yelling at Jay Crowder. Like, I, I want Alvarado boss man 99 beef. He'll probably go. <laughs> We're going to get beef with someone. It'll be Alvarado. It'll be Jackson Hayes, which that's a whole nother. Oh, man. Jackson Hayes, huh? Anyway, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of full court pressure on Chris Paul. Alvarado's done it. Herb Jones has done it. Najee Marshall has done it. And <clears throat> I think, one, it's a smart way to kind of bleed Phoenix, get them later into the clock than they want to get to. They already have a more difficult time creating the advantages without Devin Brooker. So if you're dealing with that talent deficit while also working later into the clock, that kind of works into your hands with New Orleans. Then you get into the unders that Chris Paul is dealing with. On top of them doing different things with their bigs and pick and roll as well, that we've seen JB in a drop. We've seen him play higher up. We've seen him show and recover, which is interesting to me. We've seen Larry Nash Jr. in a drop. We've seen him switch. And so they're throwing different things out there. And it's kind of, I feel like it's wearing on Chris Paul a bit because he already has to carry a large offensive load without Booker. And so when you have him basically having to fight to bring the ball up court before getting into whatever you're going to get into, then you don't expect it to be as drastic as like a four point game. Like it was a game four, but I'm also not surprised that we didn't see an 18 shot game in game four in game four for his ball, because that's a lot on him. And they're also making him work a little bit on the defensive end. Like <clears throat> CJ McCullough has been hunting him out with switches. Like, all right, we're going to make you fight over. Like Paul has been doing a decent job at the point of attack. But again, that's just a cumulative effect of working him. You're pressing him on one end, you're running through a bunch of screens on the other end, 
And even if you have them in the corner, like stashed on stashed on Herb Jones or something, <clears throat> I posted a clip on my timeline. Like Herb Jones got to the free throw line on the Maggette cut. Just like, all right, you're going to put Chris Paul here. We're going to involve him. If we're not setting a screen to get him into the action, we're going to cut. We're going to get into the paint, try to get some offensive rebounds, something like it's just a lot of body blows to Chris Paul, for lack of a better way to phrase it. And I think that's interesting. I think that puts more of a microscope on the other guys. Cam Johnson missed a lot of open shots in game four. <clears throat> Landry Shaman missed a lot of open shots in game four. Mikael Bridges, I think, on both ends, really had the worst game of – he's had his worst game of the series in game four. Couldn't really create offensively and defensively. He did not have much success against Brandon Ingram, which really nobody did in that game four. They didn't have much success there. He struggled to contain C.J. McCollum off the bounce. It wasn't great. And so you get those factors working together with the crowd – with everything else New Orleans had rolling with them. Phoenix is in kind of a tough spot right now. Well, you knew the Pelicans were going to fight, and I, I like the point of bringing in Chris Paul and attacking him on the other end, especially with how Phoenix has been locked in on Ingram and CJ with their personnel. Getting Chris Paul in those actions to try and loosen things up, especially if it's a close game, third, fourth quarter, that type of deal, that intrigues me. It's going to be a fight, and Phoenix is going to have to try and win this one. The big thing for me, outside of Brandon Ingram, which I'm sure we'll touch on here in a second, an aggressive Jonas Valanciunas for the New Orleans Pelicans. Wasn't afraid to take the pop three. Wasn't afraid to post up. Wasn't afraid to go at Aiden. If he's able to give them something adjacent to that, at least mindset-wise, Now you're cooking with something. How good was Brandon Ingram for you, though, in that game? Oh, man, he was amazing. He was making the shot making. It got to a point where it literally didn't matter who was defending him. Again, contest the possession in the third quarter, I want to say, where he gets Mikael Bridges on him, drives to the left elbow, Pump fakes three times before rising up and knocking down a super contested jumper over him. It's just like, okay, this is the Brandon Ingram we were promised. This is insane. Shot making was there. The playmaking was there. There was another position I want to say that was in the third quarter too, where he like snakes a pick and roll. They have Jackson Hayes on the wing. So Chris Paul, I think it was Chris Paul. He was in a prowl of bridges that like helped off of Jackson Hayes. Ingram gets in the air, draws basically four sons Jackson Hayes cuts from the slot and he gets a dunk out of it. It's just like, man, he's seeing the floor too on top of the shot making. Poor Tory Craig just could not defend him at all. Just fighting for his life. I've said, I'm sure everyone's seen the dunk at this point, but even beyond that fading jumpers, getting to the line, getting to the rim. Brandon Ingram just hit a level in game four. And he's been really darn good in games two through four period, but game four was a different level of shot making plus playmaking. Like, he's seeing, he's seeing the floor well. This is all-star Brandon Ingram. He was incredible in that game four. I don't have bad things to say about him. How good was Herb Jones defensively in that game? Yes. This... <laughs> He is such an insane on-ball defender. Like a rookie wing should not be a rookie should not be able to navigate screens as well as he does. And for him to be able to do that, to be able to contest without fouling a ton, to have the awareness that he has off ball as well, to where you can afford to be more aggressive elsewhere defensively and know, like, okay, if Herb has to split the difference on the weak side, like he's fine. You're not passing the ball near him. He's going to pick it off. Or for Herb himself, like, oh, sure, I can provide some help on this drive. And if you kick it out to campaign, I'm just going to block his three because the release point is low and I have wild range and a seven-foot wingspan. He just flies around. But it's also controlled chaos. Like, he knows what he's doing. Like, you look at what Matisse Thibault was able to do as a rookie. 
and the way that he was able to fly around defensively. And you still had to worry about him like biting on pump fakes or you'd have the random games where he's in foul trouble because he's doing a little bit too much or he'll take the bad angle and pick and roll and he'll get back to with the contest. But you'd like, okay, he did take a bad angle. There's almost none of that with Herb Jones. He's not a perfect defender, but like you don't see the wild lapses for him. You don't see the foul trouble for him. Like he's already an elite defender as a rookie. Not even elite for a rookie. He is an elite defender, period. It's wild and impressive. It is wild and impressive. I agree. Some of the plays, he's just a complete madman. I, I can't top it better than you did. What's uh what's his defensive ceiling for you? This already feels like a setup. Um <laughs> Just layer into Herb Jones' love. I know where this is going, but no. Um, I don't even care. Herb is great. <clears throat> I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Like he feels. He feels Paul George ish to me. But even then, that kind of undersells, like, the blocks. Like, he's <clears> – <throat> it's like a Paul George Matisse hybrid of sorts. It's weird. He's – he's incredible. No, he's very good. This will be a fun series. I'm very interested to see what game five looks like. No setup here. 